Does anybody like Chick-fil-A in here? I know I do. I already bought my hands if I could. I love Chick-fil-A. But you think about Chick-fil-A. Um, they're, you know, they're all over America. They close on Sundays, Easter, all these major holidays because they love church and they love people. But uh, something about that chicken, okay? So what they're known for is actually to raise, to buy chicken that is free from antibiotics. So I don't know if you're a health person in here, if you even care about this stuff, but it's pretty much they say they buy organic chicken. So they started this back in 2014, and then 2019 they were actually able to do it. Well, I just read recently that um, coming up in this spring of 2024, they're actually going to start buying chicken with antibi antibiotics in them. So, okay, I'm just making it known, right? Uh, the Chick-fil-A, they, they were very healthy, and they were very you know strict about what they say, but now they, they said... Uh, they're making a policy change because it's finding hard to, to find chicken to meet their standards. And I found that very interesting about the word standards. Uh, because Chick-fil-A had a standard about what they buy. And they said, we only want the best for our customers. Well, now, now they're starting to say, well, you know what? Let's release a little bit because it's too hard. Because people aren't keeping their standards. How does that make sense in our lives? Because we all live by standards, whether we drive, you know, traffic standards, we have moral standards, we know lying is wrong, right? We know stealing is wrong, we know uh, uh, killing is wrong. We know these things are wrong, so we all have standards. And I'm gonna tell you, you find somebody that doesn't have standards, I'll show you a lunatic. I'll show you a crazy person. But you know, our job, as far as our church is concerned, uh, we have to never lose the standard, which is the main thing. Our, our standard is evangelism, discipleship, church planting. That's our standard. And we also do world evangelism. That, this little church, we have standards that we live by. You know, we're not like everybody else, okay? We're not like, I could, I could go on right now, and I might upset a couple of you, but I'm going to tell you, we have standards in this place. We don't abide by the world standards. Numbers 2-2, two, two, the Israelites are to camp around the tent of the meeting some distance away from it, each of them under their own standard and holding the banners of their family. They had standards back then, and we have standards today. This, lot, this not as ever be like that where, man, we have to go to antibiotics, you know? This, this, be, this have a standard in our lives. Give with your tithe, give with your offering, and I'm telling you, God will bless you a lot. Let's go ahead and pray for this offering. Uh, as we give. God, we thank you for the blood, God. We thank you for every gift and every giver in this place, Lord. I pray your hand to be upon us, Lord. Uh, let this church, my God, hold fast to the standards you have given us, God. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you'll turn with me to Jeremiah 31, 35. Jeremiah 31, 35. I like the book of Jeremiah because it's very real, it's very honest. And it gives such clarity. There's gems all throughout it. My title is, Who Are You Going to Call? Not the Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? You know, there's an interesting story about the, in the morning of October 7th, uh, when the Hamas, they raided um, these uh, towns and villages in Israel. They were, you know, going through these uh, villages and doing horrible things to average ordinary people, um, uh, killing, um, uh, taking captive and uh, kidnapping people. But there's one interesting story that sticks out is two men, they came in armed to a family. And there was an old woman there, and she said to them, I don't, she said, don't speak to me. I don't know your language. You speak Arabic, and I speak Hebrew poorly. She said, I, I speak Argentinian Spanish. And the, the man said, what, what is Argentina? And so she put the conversation, she says, you know what, uh, 
There's a legendary soccer player, if you know his name, his name is uh, Lionel Messi. He's, a, he's probably known as probably the greatest soccer player that's ever played the sport. But he said, I'm from where he's from. Do you watch soccer? And they said, yes, yes, we like soccer. And they said, I'm from where Messi is from. And the guy said, I like Messi. I like Messi. And so he left. So the, the title of the article, it says, you know, he, she knew the right person to get herself out of this situation. I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's all about who you know. If you ever heard that statement, it's not so much as what you know, but who you know to get you where you want to be. This is not only true for job, but it's also true for God. Because the question is, do you know whose name to call upon when you are in the midst of wherever you are in life? Because the God who wants to be near us, who is always there, is right there on the other line. Question is, do you know who to call upon? So let's go ahead and read out of one verse here in Jeremiah 31, 35. Amen. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. Amen. Do you know who to call? Let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord God. We pray that the blood of Jesus would be moving, Lord. I pray that your name would be brought with clarity this day, God. That people would know who to call upon in every situation of life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about the Lord of hosts. Do you know who God is? Because he goes by many names if you study your Bible. I'm going to name a couple of them. They said here he is known as the Almighty, Almighty God, Almighty Lord, Blessed, Everlasting God, Fear of Isaac, God Almighty, God Most High, God of Abraham, God of Heaven, God of Host, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, the God of Jacob. The God of our fathers, the God of peace, the God of sin, the God of Hebrews, the God of the living, the God of the truth, the God of vengeance, holy, holy one, holy one of Israel, Lord God, Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, majesty, mighty, most high, the rock, sovereign God, spirit of God, Yahweh. So you think about every one of these names, it all has a meaning. Every one of them has an incredible move of what is going on to your situation and to what situations happen in the Bible where those names would have been used. And every one of them can apply to your life in every single situation. Through every up and down, through uh, the God of Almighty, the Lord of the host, the name that is above every other name. Each name you can personally call upon. The interesting thing is, I find that people can believe in God. I, I, I believe everybody believes in God. Give me the most staunch atheist, I can tell them uh, in their hearts, they know that there is a God. But the reality is that you go to most remote places on this planet and you will find people worshiping something. They'll worship the, the, the moon, they'll worship the sun, they'll worship stars, they'll, because they know that worship is in them. But many times, people have a hard time believing that this God can be personable. That you can have a relationship with God. That it could be deeper than just a thought and imagination of a God. Because how many people called on the moon and the moon did not come down? The sun did not come down. The stars did not come down. Joshua 2.10. It says, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. For when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, they were completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on earth below. So this is a woman, Rahab, she's speaking of her city and what they think of God. 
She says, you know what? Your God destroyed all these people. He brought you out of the Red Sea, split the, the Red Sea, and got you out of Egypt from slavery. We know that your God did that. But listen, our hearts are melting with fear because we don't know your God. We don't even think that he, yeah, if he comes here, we're dead. That's, that's the interesting thing is that they, they knew that God existed. But the, the, can he be a relational God? Can you have a relationship with this kind of God? How do you even call upon a God like this? See, I believe God is more approachable than we can even imagine. Because Jesus called God his father. And it was his father that sustained Jesus through the temptation in the wilderness, through uh, his disciples abandoning him, to even going to the cross. It was Jesus having a relationship with his father that brought him through the most difficult situations. It's because he said, he is my father. Have you ever thought about that statement? He is my father. In Matthew 6, 9, it says, this is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be, our, be your name. Matthew 23, 9, it says, Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father. He is in heaven. So Jesus repeatedly called God his father. And back then, this would be abnormal. You wouldn't really call anybody God your father because it was so abstract. Of course, they believed in God. They worshipped God. They sacrificed to God. They did things for him, but... To have a close relationship seem so far away, so 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 unnormal that they couldn't even uh, fathom that it could be done. Now, so when Jesus said, hey, when you pray, you start with our Father in heaven. And this Father, this word means Abba, means like a, it's like a love for a Father. And that's what he's saying. He says, you, you have this relation, you can have it with Abba, your Father. So on multiple occasions, Jesus said, I am one with the Father. Me and the Father are one. So you think about that statement. It's so profound because Jesus the, on the, is on the earth in the flesh and blood. And he is saying, hey, you know that God that you, look, you worship? You know that God that you sacrifice to? Me and him are one. And I am here. And he says, look at the Father. And I, I'm right here. So Jesus came in the flesh so that you and I could know that he is approachable. That, that he isn't something that, oh, I, I don't know if he exists. I don't know if he, he, he's fake. Well, he, he's real. And he would show people that he is true. So Jesus says, you need to call on the Father in heaven. Because he wants you and I to know that he's more approachable than we could have imagined. And think about our Father in heaven. Because this question that we have to answer is, do you know that you have a Father in heaven? It's so simple. But at the same time, it could be so hard to believe. Because, uh, because if, you, if you knew you had a Father in heaven, I'm going to tell you, it would change everything in your life. Every time you have a bad situation, every time you got it down, if you knew you had a Father in heaven, you say, oh, no, yeah, I got a father. He's going to take care of me. I have a father, God, that he's going to protect my life because I, I know I can call on his name. So that's what I said. Every name that I can read to you about God, it, it might seem so far away, but reality, it could be so closer than you could imagine because you know you have a, a father in heaven. And just how Jesus was always refreshed by his father. Every time he would step away and, and go and, and pray all night long in the mountains. Uh, and he would come out and be able to do things because uh, he had a relationship with his father that sustained him. And that's the main point of this morning is that you can have a God that can sustain you. You can have a God that you can call upon that can, that can lift you up out of every situation. Call the Ghostbusters. I'm going to tell you, they won't come. Well, you call God, and he'll be right there. John 4, 34 says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work because of this relational father and son. Do you know who to call? 
Because the problem is, is the underlying, what I'm saying is that God could, be, could seem like such a mystery. Such a, such a, you know, what, what is this? What, what is going on? So hard to grasp. But, but when you're going through the storms of life, and how many know storms are real when they come? When storms of life come, I'm going to tell you, you've got to know who God is. You, you've got to have a relationship with God. Because that will help you in life. And the reality is that the Lord, our God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty in our text, He is found in many times in difficulty. Job in our Bible, he, he, he's filled with this interesting uh, uh, you know, relationship between God. But he, he says in Job 31, 35, I'm reading it currently. It says, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. So he's asking God, where are you? Has anybody been there before? You ask God, where are you? Because I need to know that you are real and I need some help. And the book of Job is all about that. It's all about a man who lost everything in life. And he has friends trying to con console him and help him. But they're not helping at all. All they're doing is making things worse and bringing accusations to this guy. I'm telling you, read the Bible. It's so interesting, this book of Job. But it's saying that here, he's at the worst point of his life. And he's saying, oh, that somebody would hear me. See, I'm telling you, God can seem like such a mystery, especially when you're going through difficulties, especially when things are hard. You say, man, God, oh, if I had somebody to hear me, where is God? How many have asked that notorious question, where are you? How many people have walked on this planet and have asked that question, where are you, God? Is he close? Is he near? Is he far away? Is he everywhere or is he nowhere? Does he care? People can wonder and wonder about this question. Job asked the fair question, I believe. Where are you, God? Do you hear me? If I had someone to answer. Because that's the interesting thing. When we are in the storm, when we are in the trial, that's the time usually people either draw closer to God or they draw further away because God can seem so far away and so uninterested in these human problems. You know, there's 8 billion people on this planet. You know, I'm going through some stuff. Well, I'm sure somebody else is too. So the disciples, they ask the same question, where are you, God? And that story is found in Luke 8, 22. Jesus was with his disciples, and he said, let us go to the other side of the lake, which is interesting. So they got into the boat and set out, and they sailed, and he fell asleep. A squall came, which is a storm, came down on the lake, so the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. So the disciples were in this tremendous storm. I don't know if you've ever been in like the worst storm in your life. Like I'm talking like a storm storm. Not like a little rain, you know, dropping down. It's like, man, this is bad. I can't see nothing. I don't know about you. I've been in some storms before. I've been in hurricanes. And I, I've been in even in the open ocean in a big giant boat. And there's a massive storm. And you say, oh, boy, I, you know, is there a God? Because I'm telling you, this storm is bad. So I understand what they're saying here. They got Jesus fast asleep down in the bottom of the, uh, the boat. You know, who knows where he's at? He's so tired, he doesn't care. And he's sleeping. And they said, well, well can, can Jesus wake up? Well, if you know the story, like I said, Jesus is the one who said, let us go to the other side. Do you, do you think that Jesus would not have known that there was a storm coming? Do you think that when Jesus said, let us go to the other side, that he was going to go to the other side? He was not going to die in the middle of this little sea, this little lake, I should say, right? That's what I'm saying here is how many times you could be in a storm and you, and you think God is asleep. 
You think that God is just, man, he, he ain't hearing me. How many of you try waking somebody up who's dead asleep before, man? Wake up, wake up, wake up. And they not waking up for nothing, right? They, they do not want to wake up. I wake my family up every, all the time. On Sundays, I wake them up. On Saturdays, I wake them up. Hey, they're hard to wake up. So wake up, wake up. I had a friend who would walk around with the air horn, he told me, in his house and blow this air horn. I might do that one day, wake these kids up. You think about that, they're saying, wake up, Jesus, wake up. Wake up. You ever think about that thought, just wake up, Jesus. See, the reality is, is that, man, like, through these trials, through these letdowns, through hurts, you can think Jesus, you can think God is fast asleep. But the reality is that you have to trust that there is a God and that he is involved. Because Jesus could have said, listen, guys, you go out there in that storm. I'll meet you on the other side. I don't want to get involved. But the fact is that he went in there. So many times God is found not in the best of circumstances. What I mean is that sometimes he's found in the desert. So if, uh, if you read the book of Psalms, Psalm 63, verse 1, he says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. David wrote this psalm in the desert. So he's coming from a place where he is actually in the desert. And he's saying, God, I'm looking for you. I am thirsty for you. Look at this dry and parched land that I'm in. There is no water. Many times, many psalms are written in the desert places. And you see how he's looking for God. Oh, have you been there? You are in a dry place and you are saying, God, I'm looking for you. I'm turning over every couch. I'm looking through every nook and cranny because I'm trying to find you, God. And some people, David could have said, oh, well, well, guess what? There's no God. I'm in the desert. Here I am. He's nowhere to be found. But that's not the reality of what a Christian should do. He says, I earnestly seek for you. I thirst for you. And when you call upon his name, where is he going to be found? So now it's time to answer that question. Where is God going to be found? We know he's in the desert places because that's where we are. We know he's in the storm because that's where we are. But also, the Bible says in Psalm 63, 2, David answered his own question. Remember, he says, oh God, I earnestly seek for you. Well, this is where he says he found God. This is found in verse 2, 63, 2. I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory in the sanctuary. So what David says, I found God in the temple. I found God in church. And let me remind you about the world sanctuaries. The world sanctuaries are casinos. The world sanctuaries are on cloud vapes. The world sanctuaries are every dispensary around the corner. The world sanctuaries are every bar. Every lonely place has the world's sanctuaries, but you know what God says? No, I'm, I'm not found in those places. I'm not found there. God could be anywhere in the world. Do you know that? He's touching 8 billion people as we speak. But the reality is that God chooses to be found in the sanctuary. He says, I'm in the desert place, earnestly seeking you, but where does he find him? He says, behold, I found you in the sanctuary where your power and where your glory is, because that's what you need to know. David found God in church. And I'm telling you, whenever you are completely down, when you are out of it, the best place is to go to the sanctuary where God saved you. God is found in the church because he loves the church. He loves to be here, and he loves to be invited. And that's what we do. We invite God to live with us and to dwell with us in our midst. I'm going to tell you, every time I've been through the trials and the troubles and horrible things, man, I remember coming to the church. 
And I remember hearing worship songs. And I remember just tears flowing down my face because I, I just felt like I was in the presence of God. At, at hearing the sermons and then going down to the altar, bringing every pain that I've ever had. And I said, God, you are right here. You're right here. It wasn't that long ago. I was sitting here in the same church. I was here in the morning prayer. I encourage you all to come if you can. I remember sitting here and I remember praying and I remember saying these words, God, where are you? I need to know you are here. I need to know that you are involved. And I'm going to tell you, I felt the Holy Ghost and I felt this presence come down. And I felt, he said, take off your sandals for this place is holy. I'm telling you, God is here. It's because we invite him. So call on his name. Because he says here in Psalm 63, 7, you could write books about these verses. He says, because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. So this is where God is. The shadow of a wing. Do you understand? This is like an eagle holding out, protecting its young. I cling to you. You uphold me. Because that's the encouragement. Is no matter where you are in life, you can call upon God. In our, our text here, verse 35, this is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who declares the moon and the star to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves war, the Lord Almighty is His name. You have to know, number one, is that God is in control. He rules the day. He rules the night. He rules the sea. He rules the waves. Come on, somebody. He rules everything. God is on the throne. He is on the throne. There's no more looking around. God is on the throne. Our job, our only job, is to keep God there. You know when fear, when worry grips you? When you are afraid, when all these problems come up, family trials, the world is chaos, the you know, personal problems, financial troubles. Well, guess what? All these situations make you want to take God off the throne. Because you want to put the worry up there. You want to put the fear up there. But you have to realize, no, God needs to be on the throne. He needs to be on the center of everything in life. Because he made it all. I can't let worry, I can't let fear be thrown out. As if I would throw out, they said, the baby with the bathwater. I can't do that. i got to keep God on the throne. And secondly is that, you know what? He may go by many names. God might go by so many names. I'm telling you, you could study. You could study one word of his name in the Bible, and you could be there for eternity. He goes by specific names many times because they all deal with certain things in your life. So that means when you are at your lowest, even when you're at your highest, you call on his name. So our job is just to stay connected with God. Keep that relationship thriving. Keep it going. Always run to the altar. Always keep your ears listening to what he has to say. Keep your hearts focused on him. Because guess what? He made the heaven and the earth. Did you know that? So who are you going to call? Not Ghostbusters. Call on God. The Lord Almighty. Amen. If we could do one thing, we could bow our heads. Respecting our neighbors and all those around us. Amen. Thank you all for coming and being here. God is good. Amen. God is so good. And he's so righteous to us. I mean, better than we deserve. Absolutely better. You can think about the best thing someone has ever done for you. You know, somebody may have given you money before. Somebody even might have given you a car. Somebody might have given you a, a place to live. I mean, those are great, great things. Don't get me wrong. But the greatest gift that anyone's ever given us was salvation. The greatest gift that anyone's ever given us was that we don't have to spend eternity in hell, that we could spend eternity with our Creator. And when I spoke about our Father, we have a Father in heaven. A Father in heaven. Let that just 
sink into you. That you have a creator God that made you with a purpose and made you specifically. And you know what? The thing is, we, we, we venture off sometimes. We, we do our own lives. We fulfill our, our desires other ways. And we kind of forget about that we have a creator. But God is calling us. God calls us and calls us. Because he wants this relationship to work. He wants this relationship to thrive. He wants to be involved in your life. He doesn't want to be a second thought. He wants to be the first thought. So right now, you, you, you feel in your heart that you're not right with God. There might be sin in your life that, that has the throne, that is on top of your life. and It's always something you fall back to. I'm telling you, God wants to be there. You want to repent of your sin. You want to seek forgiveness. You want to put God back on the throne of your life. I want to pray with you. Anybody in this place, you're not right with God, not saved, might be backslid. I want you to do one thing. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I will lead you into a simple prayer. Simple prayer. Anybody in this place, not right with God, not saved, backslid in your heart. You want to seek God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, for the church, God wants to help you. God wants to help you through every situation, but you got to know who to call upon. God is more real than you could ever imagine. God is so real. And he wants to remind you of that today. He wants to remind you no matter what you're going through, no matter what pain, no matter what worry, no matter what fear may reside in your life, God says, I'm right here. I'm right here. Just call on my name. Call on my name. Amen. I want to open up the altars. Maybe God might be speaking to you. I'm going to allow him to speak to your life. Hallelujah. God, you are worthy. God, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all honor and glory. God, you are righteous. Oh, hallelujah. God, I thank you for your blood. God, I thank you for your grace. God, I thank you that you would hear us, God, when we call on you. Oh, that you are not distant. You are not far away, but you are close. Hallelujah, my God. You are close to the brokenhearted. You draw near to the weary, God. You call us blessed in your name. Hallelujah. Shianda Rabba Bayanda Rabba. Yanda Rabba Bayanda Rebebe Yanda Rabba. Yanda Rabba Bayanda Shianda Rabba. God, I pray for your people, God, right now. I'm calling on you, Lord. God, that you would reveal yourself, Lord God, in all your majesty and all your glory. Bring comfort, Lord God, to your people right now. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hide us in the shadow of your wings. She under she under Rabba. Yanda Rabba Bayanda, she under Riddiandu, she under Rabba. Worthy, 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 worthy God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are mighty, Lord. Be magnified, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Let's go to give God praise in this place. Shianda, Rebeando, Shianda, Yanda, Rababa, Yandu, Rebebe, Yanda. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Stay close to the sanctuary. God is good. Let's go ahead and praise ask God to help us as we go. Come back tonight, uh, and God will help us. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. Amen. God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you, my God, that you would reveal yourself, Lord. Uh, we're praying, Lord God, for your people. Touch them even right now. Bring us back safely at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.